My name's Sasha Pete, and I'm joined here by Drew Taylor. Now, Drew Taylor works at Football New South Wales. Welcome, Drew. Yeah, thanks for having me. Looking forward to the chat. Fantastic. So uh, let me tell the guys what you do at Football New South Wales, because you wear many hats, right? You're, you're, uh, you've got, uh, you're a head coach of the boys' state team. Um, you're, uh, you do uh, talented uh, player pathways manager. You're, you're an advanced coach and assessor. And you're a player development manager of, of the boys. But you, that's not, you've been there for a couple of years. Um, it's not your only coaching role. Uh, you were the director of coaching at Mossman Football Club. Um, and before that, you spent some time at Central Coast uh, Mariners Football Club. You, you were the uh, uh, head of performance phase and first uh, grade head coach of the, their women's side um, and had one of the junior sides there. Um, so we are super, super, super excited to speak with you. And I'm particularly interested in um, your education background. So you've, you've got a, a number of the, 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 the tickets. You hold a, an A licence. Um, Currently, and you did that in 2017, um, and something that um, you've gone, what I consider above and beyond what most people do in education in football, you did a master's degree at, at Sydney University. So uh, we're going to be speaking a little bit about that today, Drew. Brilliant. Yeah, looking forward to it. And uh, yeah, hopefully some uh, some value for yourself and anyone listening. But like I say, it'll be a big uh, learning experience for me as well because I love talking about football and, and I think sharing's uh, something we don't do enough of. So looking forward I, to it. I, I thoroughly agree. We've, we've got to, we've got to as, pe as people who coach at whatever level, I think it's important we can all share and learn from each other. And so that, that's what I'm hoping uh, this conversation is about. So firstly, if you could tell me uh, about uh, your role at Football New South Wales, and I'm particularly interested in... How does football New South Wales identify talent and then coach it? Yeah, sure. So, so I've been in the role for about 18 months. Um, it started off as a talented player pathways manager. It's moved into a role that's now called the player development manager. And, and I think in a way, even that change of title is kind of indicative of maybe the way sort of talent identification is kind of moving. So um, I think in the past, um, and this isn't just a New South Wales specific thing, probably a football specific thing, that people have seen that there might be a pathway um, and a thing called talent. And um, I'm not sure that either of them is true. Um, mm. I've described sort of instead of a pathway, it's probably more like a like a jungle gym. And, you, you know, so people go up, down, round, um, yes. fall off, climb back up. Yep. Uh, everybody's going to get there. Some of them will wind up at the top. But the reality is there's, there's a lot of ways to get there. Um, and, and talent then, I guess, ties into that as well. What, is it, what does it look like? What age can you identify it? Mm. Everybody's probably got an opinion on it. Um, my, I guess, within my role, some of the things we're looking at is, well, if, we, if we're not 100% sure what talent is and we're not 100% sure that there is a pathway, it probably makes, sure, makes more sense to have a, a broader development base. Mm. Um, and then that ties into sort of the FFA initiative, I guess, of the talent support programs that they brought in a couple of years ago before I joined Football New South Wales. But um, where maybe previously things like federations had gone, right, well, we'll pick a, a group of players at 13, we'll have them in a program uh, and hope that they turn into footballers at the age of 20 and there'll be mm -hmm. players come in, come out, you're looking after 16 or 20 players per year. Um, it's the talent support program for us. It's, look, it's looking after, A, hundreds of players within our development, but then many more hundred within our identification. Mm. So, mm. Uh, you know, in, in a broad sense, it, it's, it's sort of over having an overview and then putting into a, a framework where the whole football ecosystem is kind mm. of identifying and developing this concept of talent. Mm. And then um, us as a federation, I guess, trying to, um, drip down some best practice of what that might look like, but also then providing a framework through the talent support program for a lot of players to be to have extra training and extra games, and I guess become a link between uh, players in New South Wales and ultimately the, the different national team units. But also, mm -hmm. it's to say, well, 
it's not just that. And it's not just about the ones that get to there. That, that, those ones are great, but we also need to lift the, the, the quality of the game full stop again across the whole country. And the better everybody looks at every level, ultimately mm -hmm. our national team will wind up looking better, I think, if, yes. if the baseline becomes higher. You see, it's interesting that you say that because some of the, the criticisms of like the, the, the pinnacle of the game has been uh, reference to the dissolvement of particular institutions that, that, that trained um, um, our, the pinnacle of our talents, okay? And I think the, the, the criticisms of success at the, the highest pinnacle of our game um, draws a, a long bow as to what's happening down the pyramid, okay? So I think there are pros and cons of each of the ideas um, but I would, I, would, I would suggest that maybe we're getting better at producing more players and we're understanding that um, the, the talent pool, you're going to have players that come in and out of that uh, framework um, and we don't know who's going to make it, right? We actually, you know, those 20 boys. Um, so what, what are your thoughts about, let's say, you know, taking that, that top of the tree because you're, you're helping funnel that that grassroots and, and supporting that grassroots enablement to, to generate, you know, maybe four or six boys from New South Wales into, you know, a, a Joey side or an Oli Roo side, um, you know, in any, any given 23-man squad, there'd be, you know, half a dozen to a dozen uh, New South Welshmen. Yeah, so I think I think a few things. So, so I guess one of the Part of the, you know, and that criticism when people talk about things like the AIS and, and, and the, the state federations. And, and look, I think at the time, look, the results are clear. There were lots of players being produced through those. There was also lots of players being produced not through those at mm. that time as well, yes. uh, by the way. So there are professional footballers from the golden generation that, that didn't go through that pathway, but everyone mm -hmm. points to that as the pathway. So that's mm. probably one thing to look at. And then the other is to say, well, yeah, it was it was great. It was a finish, but it was a finishing school. So they took people yes. at 17, 18. So they didn't they didn't grab them at thirteen and move mm. them to Canberra and do it. It mm. was so there was things going on underneath it um, mm. back yeah, back then with the way the NSL was and and it was a different time. So there was probably just more people playing more unstructured football. There was more cultural mm. connection to clubs. There was more unstructured play going on yes. uh, in Australia, but also probably around the world. Um, what there wasn't was fully professional football clubs that can potentially mm. uh, replace that kind of system, which we now do have now. Good, bad or indifferent, they're all doing their own thing. But even now when we look at it and you look at the recent um, Joey squads or um, even young Socceroos squads, yes, there are players from the, the HAL academies that are in them and that's brilliant. And, and within our, our New South Wales context, Sydney and Western Sydney, there's players from the Mariners, there's players from the Jets. Brilliant. There's also players from outside of that, players that are getting identified through TSPs, et cetera. So the, the piece then would be to say, well, whatever you see your, your structure or your pathway as, no matter when it was, there are still players coming in from outside yes. because nobody can build it well enough that you know who they all are and who's going to suddenly come and go. So mm -hmm. I guess that kind of ties to it. The, the broader it is, the better. The more the more professional clubs there are and it would help to have more than 10 and then mm. the better everybody below it is working towards being able to do it, being able to have it. And so for now, um, I think the role of federations is important and some, some will disagree and say that the federation should go. That's fine. My opinion is at the moment, there's a big gap between international football, HAL Academy football, NPL football, and what goes on below and the the, mm. the challenge for all of us is to bring that gap like that so that yeah. so that you yeah. know that they potentially can do it um yeah. and so things like regular elite games where say a talent support hub or, or a team is playing against the hal academy you can see where it's at and there are lots of players and i can only speak from a new south wales perspective at the moment but there are lots of players outside those um, Howl Academies, who are probably uh, as good as players within it, or very close, or yes. could do it. 
But the yep. reality is for any program, whether it's an AIS, whether it's a federation, it's a team, it's a club, unless we get to a space like a Portugal where Porto can have like four under 16s teams, you've got 16, you've got 16 players per age group in Sydney, 16 at the Wanderers, 16 at Melbourne City, 16 at Perth. You've got 100 players in there. Until we can get a system of clubs who can all provide a higher level of, I guess, regulated and that's not dictated, but regulated. What are they actually doing? Are they doing a good job? Are mm. their players being provided? Do they have the right players in there to start with? Mm. Um, I think there's a role to play for things like talent support programs to, to yes. know where the players are, give them an opportunity to be seen. And ultimately, it's all about um, two things, I guess. Number one, yeah, can we take some high-level players to some higher places? But two, can we filter everything down so that more players are enjoying the game because there's no talented player going for a, to play for Australia that's leaving our sport to play another sport? Yes. So every player that walks away from our game, who's to say they weren't the next Socceroo or Matilda? Mm, very true. And which sort of funnels into my next question. What are the things that you look to to coach these talents? So the people are, people are coming in across your uh, across your uh, your desk. What are the things that you're then doing to ensure that they love the game, and then you're able to to, to take it from here to there? Yeah. So so we we've internally been talking about that a lot, right? So I guess there's a few things within their within the team trainings within a club wherever it is. There's probably going to be a large amount of focus on the functionality of that team to mm -hmm. to have some success on the weekend that will then keep that team uh, appearing to be a successful team club etc and so a lot of the trainings and also a lot of the way coach education goes is towards developing teams we look at it and go right we've got to we've got to develop individuals we're going to develop individuals but it's a team sport so what does that look like uh to strip it down, basically, to be successful at the game, you've got to score goals and stop goals. So if you're in the front third, either be able to score a goal or set up a goal. If you're at the back, stop it, first and foremost. So, And then, then from there, you know, I guess there's some, some orders of priority. So within their team setting, they might be, yep, keep it. This is how we're going to play. We're going to say, right, let's get better um, individually, technically, and sort of individually, tactically or some, some sort of the principles of play, rather than how's this team going to function. So the practices will, will like we, we only see them once a week on top of what they're doing within their club. Um, and then we'll go into some clubs and try to help them with what they're doing as well. But a lot of things like wave practices, 3v2 attacking, 2v3 attacking, 1v1 yeah. attacking, um, with transition moments. So not just do it, stop, no, do it. Okay, you're being punished. Now you're going to go and have to press from the front, get the ball back, score the goal. Um, any positioning game or possession game or however you want to term it, there's going to be goals involved. There's going to be an outcome where you're scoring goals, stopping goals. And then that will also, I guess, tie into this idea of, of the winning mentality as opposed to winning. So winning the game, ah, it is what it is. Yeah. Winning mentality, win your moments, win your individual battle, um, be able to receive, retain and release with that player trying to get it off you and his mate trying to get it off you that might develop a player who can then, as they progress and go into teams with other players, um, you know, they're going to be able to sort of um, outwit and outplay and outlast the opponent. And then, you know, we're sort of looking at it going, well, say we take 16 under 14s into the program, that group of 16, they're not going to go play professionally together. They're not going to play for the Joeys together. One or yeah. two of them might. So they're going to have to be adaptable. Yes. But the, the baseline competencies that just about every footballer is going to need. And then I guess we're also looking at it as, let's make it kind of outcome-based. So not fluff like you must be two-footed. Mm. For me, that's fluff. Mm. You, you need to be effective. You might be more effective if you can use both feet. Mm. But do you know what? If you, can, if, you're gonna, if you can play that pass that sets up that goal, with the outside of your foot. So yeah, I recall a goal like Matt Leckie, you cross one of the outside of his foot, this bizarre cross, or you look at Harry Kuehl bent one in the top corner a few years ago in the Premier League, that you look at it and go, that's such a weird technique to use. But do you know what? It's in the net and your team's got the bickies. Now, if he's trying to do it and it's going out the sideline, it might be, hey, maybe the right foot would be better here or the left foot. But ultimately, that's... that's 
and help these players to become the best version of themselves uh, and turn their strengths into weapons. That's our other big bit. So, mm. yeah, we're going to have to get everybody. You can't have a glaring weakness, but I would argue that just about every player who's playing at the top level has a weapon of, yes. of some kind. Um, yeah. There's very few that you just go, yeah, look, they're, they're kind of all right at everything. Yeah. And, and I think we tend to try to coach everybody to just kind of be all right at everything in the mm. broader spectrum. Mm, mm, mm. Without supporting the, the the individuality of that player in the job that they're doing. You know, um, I was uh, I was watching a, a 1986 uh, game this week. I remember as a as a ten year old, my father taking me to. Um, uh, an NSL game um, and, and him now reminiscing about top flight football back then. And it was a top of the table clash between two teams, one, one by the name of Footscray Just and the other by the name of Heidelberg Alexander. And uh, watching the football now, Les Murray talking about the game um, <clears throat> and, um, you know, many Socceroos playing that game and the, the, the the, just the, the, the pitch standard, right? We, we, it, there was a, a socceroo in goals for, for Heidelberg, Jeff Olver. Um, many, you know, big names of the game. And looking back and looking at the standard of football now, as a 10-year-old thinking back uh, to that game, uh, standing on that pole in Footscray, and now looking back at what that game was in 1986, it seems like it was sort of maybe like a state two-level or state one level game, right? Not 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 what the weekend where I watched the, the, the final. So, you know, I, I think there's the, the mentality shift of where we where we have, we've come light years apart. I think there's a lot of criticisms about how we've performed and we look at the national team success. But if you look at let's say grassroots when you and I played as a kid and what happened and the level of coaching that is transpiring, just the, the, the sheer amount of um, energy that people are putting into coaching, what's happening at the state level, all of this is funneling down, right? So um, thank you for your efforts and what you're doing in uh, foot, football New South Wales and, and being playing your part. I'm particularly interested in um, your work there about um, how you've implemented, you're talking about training sessions, um, being referenced of a game. You, you touched on that theme. And your master's degree actually uh, focused on how you use PDE in session plans. So I'd be keen, because obviously, um, first, for, for those people who don't know what PDE is, maybe you can explain that to, to the lay person. And then why did you have this thesis um, and why did you write it? Yeah, sure. So, so, so PDE, so perception, decision, execution, um, or like it's sometimes kind of called like perception, action, coupling, or depending on depending on, and, and there's some nuances, but the basic idea is that um, a technical action doesn't or doesn't take place within our game without first having to sort of perceive what's going on, make a decision, and then execute it. Um, I think some people probably break that down too much. Um, the reality that they've all got to happen really quickly. Um, mm -hmm. So, so the reason I guess I became interested in it. So I was doing some reading, doing some different, um, looking at some different, different, I guess, texts, talking to some different people, watching some different types of training. So people doing one-on-one uh, -on -one trainings outside of the game, people doing one-on-one -on -one trainings, but incorporating, um, I don't know, like lights that you go and, and go and hit and people going, yep, that'll be good. No, that won't be good. People doing ladder work, people doing um, small-sided training, people doing large training, people doing all sorts and kind of just within my own head going, well, what, what do I believe in? Um, I've been over to Europe a couple of times, gone into different environments. So, mm -hmm. for instance, I went into Bayer Leverkusen for a few days with their youth and you see some practices going on that then when I'm on an FFA course, it's maybe like, no, well, you shouldn't be doing that. And, and you go, okay, all right, that's okay. That, that's fine, but they're doing it there. And then, then talking to some colleagues in Germany and they're kind of going, yeah, no, well, we probably wouldn't do that either. So it's like, okay, so this isn't, this isn't one country or another country. This isn't good or bad. It's you know, you talk to one person, is one-on-one on, one training with, uh, with somebody good. 
yeah, it's, it's great. It, it, it improves them. And then somebody else says, no, nah, it's a waste of money. Why would you be bouncing the ball off a, off a trampoline and then swinging it past a, a net with holes in it? There's no goalkeepers. <laughs> so these were all the things that were basically going on in my head. Yeah. And the reason I wrote a master's, it was, uh, <clears throat> it was accidental in some okay. respects. So basically, I... I um, I contacted a guy, a guy called Dr. Paul Lark, and he's, he was at Sydney University at the time. In 2013, I was coaching the Institute girls at Football New South Wales, and, and Paul had come in and used me as one of the, uh, one of the coaches on, on a, a thesis that he was writing or that one of his students was writing, something around coaching behaviours. And uh, so I got put forward as a an expert coach where they were looking across a whole heap of different environments, how a coach is coaching, what are they doing in their sessions and why. Anyway, mm-hmm. fast forward a couple of years, I contacted him and said, look, the hamster in my brain's going. You're an expert. Can I come and talk to you about it? Went and talked to him. He said, yeah, it's a great point. There's not that much research about it. Put me in touch with his, um, the head of the faculty, um, Don O'Connor, Went to her. She said, yeah, brilliant. Don't know. I don't know either. Hey, have you done any uni study? I said, yeah, look, I've done a couple of degrees before. I'm probably not going to do any more. Yeah, you should do something. I said, okay, here we go. Mm-hmm. Started doing a bit of research, applied, uh, and next thing <laughs> I was doing a, I was doing a, a <laughs> master's by research and away <laughs> I went. So, so that's, that's how it happened. And, and look, uh, it was interesting because I then I then went about it in a way where I I was trying to look at decision making and, and within you, elite youth footballers, um, a master's degree is only one year, so you know a PhD. If I had four years to do it with hundreds of people, but I had a fairly small sample size. Um, I was I went in to do some things where I'd seen some different things overseas. I've read some different things and I thought, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put some of these into practice. I'm going to see whether they make uh, a difference. Okay. Uh, partly knowing that, look, in a short amount of time, I might, not, I might not get any answers here, but at least I'll have raised a lot of questions for myself. Mm-hmm. And look, the literature review part of the thesis, even though it sounds like the boring bit, is probably the bit that was the best bit because it gave me a reason to go and read hundreds of Mm. articles and books and listen to people talk to people so i got a much broader understanding of how much i didn't understand yes before i even did the thing and to be honest about even halfway through it i was thinking yeah okay i'm already changing my view here so i'm going to go through with this thing because i'm committed to it and then look four or five years later there's tons of stuff out there about this stuff constraints that approach uh, different uh, you know ecological dynamics all this stuff it was probably there but it wasn't as prevalent and if I if I was to write the thing now it would look different mm. everything okay. about it would, would be different but what it did is set me down the path of going do you know what I'm, I'm actually interested in this stuff and it's going to underpin what I do and moreover I firmly believe that when people just say stuff like um, well, because because that's what I did, or because mm. it's my opinion, mm. I, you can go back and go, hey, there's a whole world out there, mm. and you can access it through your computer. So put Google Scholar in and type in what you're trying to tell me, read about it, and then let's then let's have a, a real discussion based mm. not just on opinions, but on maybe something where people that are smarter than us. Mm. I've actually gone and done some of this stuff. Yes. And then the other part is to go, there's also lots of stuff written out there where the reality is when you go and attempt it on a park, it might not work because they're talking theoretical. So it's How being true. able to How marry true. the two. And, mm. and that's probably the, you know, the benefit of having gone through it. Fantastic. Thank you very, very much for that sort of the why. I mean, the, 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 whole, the, the whole idea about, getting that body of research, re- researching, you know, a lot of the fundamentals of why we have a framework. You touched on the work that, that uh, the Cross did in, in 2013 that set up our now framework. Um, and early, as part, uh, early part of the interview, you talk about, you know, football is simple, right? You, you score one more goal, 
you said the front third's about scoring goals, the, the, the back third's about uh, keeping goals. That, that idea, and, and you touched on the fact that we need to have training sessions that replicate a game, right? The, the particular thing that I'm interested in learning more about PDE in a session design is how are you using PDE in your passing practices, in your, your, your positional game? What are the things that you're actually doing now, today, that built off when you wrote the thesis a couple of years ago? So what, what has shifted? Yeah, so I guess, um, I think when I wrote the thesis, I was, I was down a space of, right, we, we need to just add PDE mm -hmm. to, to football activities. Yep. yep. So if you're going to do a ladder practice, have yes. PDE in it. If you're going to do a passing practice, have PDE in it. So Good. that's the top up. Mm. I think where I've shifted to now is if you're doing if you're doing it and it doesn't have it in it, why are you doing it? Okay. So it would be <clears throat> rather so looking at it as a practice and going, I need to make this replicate the game. Yeah. Start with the game and go, right, what practice will replicate the game? Okay. itself and how how can I keep the demands of the game there in everything I do in practice and and my big bit now uh, and it's got to is if you're going to do anything other than just play a game at training you better have a good reason for it and it better be better than just playing the game because mm. the game's the game's the game so mm. if you're saying I'm going to do three trainings a week with my team four till 5 30 p.m whatever why would you not just turn up and play the game for an hour and a half those three times? Because I would argue you'll get a big amount of gains out of that, mm. right? The reason in my head that you don't do that is because there's only one ball mm. and, say, 16 players. So even if you just really rudimentary, like, divide up the hour and a half into, you know, okay, so there's 90 minutes, there's 16 people, they can get five minutes of ball time each if mm -hmm. they want to share the thing, if you're yeah. playing nonstop. So if you um, do something that halves that number of people, so play two 4v4s, two mm -hmm. balls, and now they're on 10 minutes. If you go mm -hmm. to 2v2s, now they're on 20 minutes. If you mm -hmm. go to something that's not having to go the whole way and you're going to compress the time and space, and maybe now we're at 40 minutes. And so that's the justification for me. But the moment that then goes away from preparing for the game. So what, so yeah, we could get 90 minutes if we stand opposite each other for the 90 minutes and pass it back and forth. Da, 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 like I did in the under tens when I was playing, yeah, pass for half an hour between you get your technique. Right. Now that's not the game because we don't pass back and forth like that. That doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. But if it's me and a friend trying to get past you and scoring some small goals. So you, so there's attack defense, two transition moments, somebody to play with, we can make depth, we can make width, we can penetrate the pass, we can take you on, you're going to have to defend, you're going to have to cover, you're going to have to balance. Mm. Even in a 2v2, we're probably, we're probably winning. Or even in a 1v1 with bounces on the ends, it might be that, well, can you get mm. it and play forward? You might have to use your body to pin and protect and then get past. But whatever it's going to be, make it look like, if I said to you, right, where does that, here's a game, show me when that occurred, you should be able to go fast forward, fast forward. Oh, yeah, that looks something like that. Brilliant. That for yeah. me makes sense. Yes, and the, and and I couldn't agree uh, more. And and what do the kids love, right? You, you say, uh, was today a good session, right? Is that, right. Yeah, we, we we played, we scored goals, we enjoyed ourselves. You know, what a, what a, what a, what are uh, people who love the game? What do they want? Um, but what I want to drill down to is. What was the thesis before you started? Did you have a thesis, right? So you said, okay, I'm going to focus on PDE in the moment. Did you think, okay, with PDE, I'm going to get a better outcome? Or am I, did you just, were you just open? What was the original idea? No, no, yeah, so the original thesis was basically that, you, that passing practices were uh, of limited to no value. Uh -huh. That the positioning games and game training probably were uh, and that the training game at the end certainly was if you take that mm -hmm. uh, model of a training session. Um, there's probably an argument in my head that says the game training bit now is maybe not as valuable as we think, but it's maybe another 
evolution. But at the time, it was the passing practice, whatever that looks like, probably isn't right. That it's yes. going to be a pattern that you're going to pass here, do this, do that. There's going to be a maybe even a semi-active defender that's going to do something. And, yes. and look, I think coaching's moved on from there anyway, even within yes. our own coaching courses, that, that yep. these things should be taking place. My thesis was basically that you could do, you could spend that time better by doing things with high PDE and high technical. Um, so uh, playing, having to choose colours, go through gates, overload in the brain, a whole heap of things. Yeah. Um, in the end, in the time I had, so I was also doing this with a number of players myself yes. as part of a part of my own little business or whatever you would call it. So. There was some anecdotal evidence for me that players were getting better and they were enjoying it. Mm. Went in and did it. The, the, the sort of where we came out of it was that did it have a massive impact in, in six weeks? No, it didn't. But players did feel yes. like they were enjoying it more mm. and actually getting better out of it. So mm. even in that way, you kind of go, okay, so things where you feel like you're being challenged and it feels like it's more difficult within the game potentially is of more value to those players because maybe they're going to try and get better at it. And there was mm. players going away and going, oh, that thing you tried to get me to do, I went away and practiced that and I reckon I can now do it. So they're actually going practicing football, whereas it's, I find it highly unlikely that too many kids go home and go, I'm going to practice the passing drill we did tonight. You know, so there's, there's sort of some tangible bits there that, that came out of it. Um, I did some stuff around self-assessment of their own decision-making, mm. some video-based decision-making stuff, which I'm still not, I still don't know years later whether that, that actually replicates what's going on in the game because it's not a decision within the game. It's probably more a, a, of a test of football knowledge mm -hmm. rather than PDA. Uh, but it was still a, it was still an interesting thing to, to go through. But mm. Yeah, I think I think what it showed is that ultimately, probably the passing practice bit, if it's quite isolated, it probably doesn't matter what you're doing in that bit. So you might as well yeah. be doing something that's more fun and more engaging. And you know the the, the interesting thing you you drive past us, you know, a, a, you know the first fifteen or twenty minutes of a soccer practice on any field in the country, and you've got you know. 14 to 16 people standing, one person, you know, passing one ball, you know, maybe doing a wall pass or something. And, and literally, so I think that part of training um, is a little bit sad. And so any coach who's might be watching this, if, if, you, if you're doing that and, and don't have some PDE in that passing practice, maybe, maybe uh, think about what it is that you're doing and what value are you getting out of it, right? Um, yeah, I think so. And, and I also think, look, there's been, there's been this movement towards like the, I think here in this country, we're calling it like the gig methodology mm. or whole part whole, uh, that it might make sense to, to start most practices with something that resembles the, like the game. So whether that, whether, look, whether that's 8v8, whether that's 4v4, but I think there's some really tangible benefits that first of all, the training looks and feels like the game. The first mm. thing people are doing when they get there particularly with kids is, well, they're doing what they want to do. So that's great. It'll burn off some of the energy that they've yes. got that usually we wait until minute 50 of the 60 minute session and go, oh, okay, you can have a game now. Now suddenly they're really like enthused. Well, what about if we did 15 minutes at the start, they burn it all off as players are turning up and running from the car park and mum was late from work. It doesn't matter. Hey, you got two kids at training. You've got a game. And as yes. they come, just filter in, filter in. If your Love training it. session starts 10 minutes late, who cares? Because otherwise, I'm trying to run my drill. Here comes Sasha P. He's late. You've killed my drill. Now I've got yes. to explain it to you again. If you're having to explain the game of 4v4 football, to the, you've got a big problem, huh? So it makes it easier for coaches as well and, and frames us up on something that we can coach. Drew, music to my ears, at, 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 at speaking to like-minded people. You know, how, I want to know how I get my kids... 15 minutes early to training, okay? So if I've got access, if, if my session starts at a particular on the hour, okay, I want my kids rocking up 15 minutes early because they know there's a small-sided game going on and as they, they come in, we start having kicking the ball, right? Yeah, so, I, think, um, I think that's it. It's, if you've got four cones and two goals or even four more cones to make the goals, 
The moment you get out of the car, slap them down on the ground. That's they it. don't even need bibs because kids don't need bibs in the front yard. You go set up whatever it is that that you feel is is our perception of the coaching and the and the teaching part. Mm-hmm. And then the other part that I think about is, uh, and then, uh, we feel like the only time the players will be learning is when we're doing the teaching. Yes, learning learning's on the learner. So just because we're teaching doesn't mean they're learning, and just because we're not teaching doesn't mean they're not learning. They play four v four for twenty minutes. They're going to learn something. Mm-hmm. And then they'll come to us and maybe they'll be engaged or maybe they won't. Maybe they'll look great and then it also ties into, I think we've all got to embrace chaos in our sessions more. Mm. So there's a real thing, I think, that we want sessions to look good because it makes us look good as a coach. So it's a nice line. They were doing that. The passing practice, the pattern looked brilliant. It was good. The mums and dads up there went, hey, how good's that? You've got control. And that's absolutely brilliant. The game's chaotic. There's, there's yeah. a lot of players. There's stuff going on everywhere. The amount of times you hear, hey, we played great stuff, but all the opposition did is get a one pass between us and score. Yeah, that's not their problem. That's your problem. Yes. They're undoing yes. you with that. That's the game. You've now mm. got to, you, your team needs to be able to deal with that. Don't, don't, be, don't be that one that goes, oh, it's everything else. The other team doesn't play. Mm. Now, that's part of it. That's, that's the learning. So how do we deal with that? And probably the way we deal with it is they learn to deal with it by playing the game against people that might kick it. So if you're playing four and four at the start and one of your kids is kicking it and yet your team's having to deal with it, maybe there's some learning taking place and that's okay. And, and a little bit of chaos, it is what it is if you, if you can plan for it. Powerful. Look, you know, I mean, if there's, you know, if that's the only nugget that that people take out of this conversation, well, that that's a small gift. So um, let, let's let's shift gears a little bit. I, I ever since um, I, I, I came across your profile, I've I've now been uh, looking at how you also promote the game because you're you're not only a um, a learner of our of the game, but you also I. You, you actively try and promote um, other people in, in, in the game. And so uh, I took uh, to liking your, your, your podcasts, um, the work that you're doing or you're contributing to that. Um, so what made you start a podcast? Yeah, so look, I guess look, the, the reality is it was... So, so I do it with, with two colleagues of mine, so Chris yeah. Adams and Warren yep. Bree. So Chris is the... The coach education manager warrants it's uh, the men's and boys technical director at football new south wales we've been sort of talking about look this this is something that should be done uh, i think we all share the view that in australia we don't we don't value what we've got in this country so 100%. in terms of, of everything so if our curriculum's good bad and different the fact that it says australia on the front mm. we bring it down but you put the same thing out and it said croatia People would be like, hey, this is brilliant. We've got coaches doing well. We'll bring them down. Players, yeah, just about anything. Uh, we all go and listen to podcasts from overseas to get mm-hmm. our stuff. Let's listen to the best of England. Let's listen to the best of America. Let's listen to this, that. Let's read books from everywhere else. And, and we kind of were like, do you know what? There's lots of there's lots of good football people in this country. There are, mm-hmm. there are coaches coaching at the top level. Joe Montemurro with Arsenal, you, you can't get better. There's, there's an Australian. What Ange is doing, what, uh, you know, people all over the place and not just ones that go overseas and not just professional mm. ones. Um, mm. There are good people. There are good coach educators. There are bad people. There are bad coaches. But the same yep. as every country. So yes. why do we have to keep looking outside? Can we shine a light on some things that are going on here? But can we also go and talk to some people overseas that we can actually learn from? Okay. Not people just for the sake of, hey, let's go get this guy that everybody gets. Mm. Um, and, and, and then, so we'd been talking about the need to do it. And then when COVID hit, we thought, you know, we all got stood down from our jobs. And we thought, you know what? We're all football people. We want to stay connected to it. But rather than just going on every webinar and listen to every podcast, let's do some stuff that genuinely interests us. Let's bring this thing to life. Let's see what we can do. Mm. Started at look, to be honest, we started off with people we knew. Yeah. So um, Spencer Pryor, 
uh, he, he coached me years ago when he first moved out from England. But let's get some experiences of him playing in the Premier League, coaching with the Matildas, coaching in Thailand. Ivan Yolak, I worked with him at North Shore Mariners when I was doing some stuff there. Let's get your experiences of playing. Let's get your experiences of going to school with Mark Viduka. Let's get people who actually know about Viduka. Let's talk to him. You're a coach educator. You've worked now. And then from there, it started to be a bit more like, oh, okay, we can branch out here. We can talk to some people overseas. We talked to Roy Carroll about what it was like to play under Alex Ferguson. Unbelievable. You know, we talked to people... Uh, people that are in and out. We talk to Rui Tome from Porto. What do you do in Portugal? What is so? This isn't. This is a guy nobody hears. Nobody's heard of him. But this guy's a technical director within Porto's youth academy. So it's not fluff. It's real. It's hey, mm. come on, tell us, tell us. What are we doing? People in Germany that are that are. Come on, you you tell us. Give us the nuggets of what's actually going on. Not at a level that's unattainable. Mm -hmm. Just at a level with kids in countries. What is it? Good, bad, indifferent? And is everything actually is doom and gloom or do we just need to tweak some bits but most okay. importantly I did, I did it to make myself better because there's some people on there that if I don't contact them and go hey I run a podcast they never talk to me mm. so it was mm. it was a great opportunity and then look I said it earlier I, I firmly believe that particularly for all of us that are working in the youth space if you're trying to keep stuff to yourself you're probably in the wrong thing because mm. we need to make the game better we need to make the players better so we've got to strive to, to improve ourselves in the game, not prove ourselves. So me having some knowledge and only being able to share it with the 16 kids. Yeah. What a waste. Share your good, share your bad, share it, share it out there. Let's just, and it just gets the ball rolling. People can agree or disagree. It yes. doesn't bother me once. They bit. always will. Really, you yeah. know, disagree. Happy days. Again, yeah. let's go. Let's both research it. Let's have a really nuanced debate about what's why and mm. how do we all move forward. So, Look, that yeah. was that was super cool. I, I I couldn't agree more. We we often look if it's got a a badge on it from another country, we automatically believe that it's you know infinitely better, right? So not just five or ten or twenty percent better. And and yes, I think there's a lot that we can learn from the top academies in the world. So we we should look to to. Uh, the best academies in the world and see what they're doing. And that, that really might be the standard. Okay. So, but there's so much quality within this country and, and a yearning um, for the love of our game and a nuance and understanding that we have a unique style of play. There is an Australian way of football. Okay. So it's, it's, it is, um, I think there's uh, an idea that maybe we should play in a different way, but there's something that makes us uniquely Australian, okay? If, you, if I look at every side that has played and represented that green and gold, there's, there's some, you know, if I said the overall things that, uh, that you know, the people who wanted to work hard for each other, right? That happens, that happens that regardless of what level of football I watch. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and look, I think the other thing that, that we sometimes forget is we're in a, we're in a unique country. Mm. Like in footballing, we're on a massive island on the wrong side of the world. Mm. So when, I'm in Ger when I was in Germany, for instance, you know, so I'm at, a, at Bayer Leverkusen's training. They've got the under-16s playing Real Madrid. The under-14s that I'm working with are off on the weekend to play a tournament in Amsterdam, so mm. in Holland. When I was over in England, you know, I was in at Man City. They've got Feyenoord in in the 10s and 11s. You know, the 18s are out there playing Derby, but they're, then they're going to go elsewhere. When I was at Huddersfield, they're doing a thing where they've got rid of some of their academy and they're going to go just do overseas bespoke tours. That's mm. how they're going to run it. And it's like, that's all possible when everything's a bus right away, you can move countries like I can move suburbs. Yes. Here, we've got cities dotted around a massive country with a huge desert in the middle. Mm. There's oceans everywhere. It costs thousands to get to our nearest neighbours. Our nearest neighbours aren't massive football countries. We probably need to engage Asia better than we do, but that's mm. way above my pay grade. But... You know, like there's all these unique bits where you can't just go, hey, just do it like them. Look at that. It's beautiful. They, they do it that way. Mm. 
Yeah, yeah, they do. But they can also catch a bus and play mm. against anybody they want. We we can't. We've got to find we've got mm. to find uniquely Australian ways solve our problems. To, to play uniquely Australian football to solve our problems and and mm. compete. Um, mm. And you can't. Every anybody. Yeah, but this is how. No. Nah. Are they on a massive island on the wrong side of the world with 25 million around the outside of it? Yes. No, they're not. Mm. So it's a little bit different. And it's True. not just True. we don't have a culture. That's fluff. Yeah. Absolute That's fluff. fluff. Yeah. So uh, couldn't agree more. This is, uh, this is a really, really interesting um, conversation. I'm enjoying it. The, um, I came across your uh, profile based on uh, a piece of information that, um, you shared openly um, with uh, the footballing community. You shared it on your LinkedIn page. So I'm, I, um, I, I, I use LinkedIn a lot. And so um, I came across your profile. Uh, it was your LinkedIn page. And I saw this session design on football, right? I'm thinking, okay. And that's how I came across your work, okay? Um, that then uh, allowed me to... To understand who you are and, and read your master's thesis, and, but I would like to uh, for you to to be able to to share that session design for the people that are that are watching, uh, going to be watching this. And, and first, maybe tell us why you did this. You know, five slides, um, and why did you share it? Uh, so I guess. <sighs> I guess a couple of things. So, so, so the the big part of it was so. So, if, as well as doing the podcast stuff, been doing this thing called the Monday Night Coaches Club. So, with a guy called Gareth Long from ACPA, and and again with Chris and Warren, and guests from around the world, and and a whole heap of interested learners coming on, and and so that was sort of every Monday night across the COVID, and it's dropped back a bit, but but it was a really good learning experience with some good, fantastic guests coming, unbelievable guests coming on who really did share openly really open. Here's, here's what I do. Here's what I do. Um, so that, that was part of it going, yeah, this is brilliant that people are so open to sharing and, mm. and are kind of you know, tied in with me. And, and I'm talking people that are uh, Ben Bartlett, you know, head of coaching at Fulham. So he's probably got some stuff he maybe, you know, but nah, here you go here for what Nick Levitt, UK coaching, Jan van Loon, Ultrecht. Uh, so, hey, little me, yeah, I probably should be prepared to share if, if I feel it's of value. That, that was number one. Um, and within that, I shared some stuff myself and some people were kind of going, well, you know, how do you, how do you come up with this? Why? Exactly the question, you, this question, you're asking why. Why do you believe that? How did you come up with it? What are you doing? And then also within, I guess, coach education, coach development stuff that I do, sometimes some questions of, well, how do you come up with that? How do you get there? You try to explain it. Mm. Anyway, part uh, that was so. That's one part. The other part is uh, when I did my A license, you do a vision and philosophy statement. Mine was like three hundred pages long, right? And it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's like it had got to this point where you're just going, nah, this is too big. And um, one of the people we're talking to was um, a guy named Dan Machichu, who used to be the England technical lead for for youth and a youth team coach for England. He's now at Arsenal, and he. He threw some stuff up that he'd learn across his journey, like describe yourself as a coach in one word. Um, you know, and he had his that he'd learned from Brian Ashworth. You're playing philosophy in one page. And, and I'd actually heard him give uh, on some podcasts a couple of years ago and it had always kind of been this thing where I was like, do you know what, I should do that. And um, so I'd been working towards that, bringing everything okay. down into smaller and smaller and smaller where I basically got my whole vision and philosophy into 10 slides, okay. <laughs> which... Uh, right. Of which uh, session design was a part of it, and then so these things all tying together, I thought, you know what, uh, I'd love to be able to just go, hey, there's there's what I actually do, not what I do because I got caught on its course, not because I've got to tell somebody, not because it's the right way or the wrong way or somebody else's way. It's yep. just my way, and I'm yep. gonna I'm gonna put myself together something that is fundamentally what I believe, how I plan my sessions. And it was Good. for myself. This Good. is my thing. This is my push. And then uh, shared it with a couple of people. Do you mind, people. Do you mind bringing it up now and, and sharing it again? So let's bring it up. Yeah. yeah. No, no worries. I'll, I'll, I'll find it while I talk here. And um, 
it, yeah, I just sort of got to a point where I thought, you know what, I, I um, if you can let me screen screen share, then I'll yeah, be able to do yeah, it. Yeah, it's that's um, uh... But fundamentally, what I believe in, and some people said, hey, why don't you why don't you throw it out there and see see what people think? So I thought, you know what, I will do that, and um, yeah, look, you should be able to of, share your screen of, now. A lot of people sort of. Uh, so we're saying some stuff. So this is this is. So this was it. Can you see that there? It's coming up right now. Oh, there yeah. we go. Yeah. So there we go. So so basically, it was. Uh, yeah, in a simple bit, it's taking different pieces from my own sort of my own vision of what coaching could look like, and basically going, look, look, here it is, and and with a challenge to the world or anybody that had any interest in it, look. Use it, share it, steal it, whatever you want. Come back to me and look. Some people have come back and said, look, I disagree with this. Happy days, brilliant, no problem. But some things we've talked about, um, you know, and, and it basically came off that uh, that pyramid there that I've got there. That, that That's sort of my – I think we sometimes try to break things down into age groups, Um you know, uh, so this would what be, be happening when you, when the kids are this age. I'm not sure that that's the case. I think, like I said before, it's more of a it can go up and down, but some general things that we'll go through. So depending on age and stage, we sort of work more towards what a team might look like. Fundamentally, helping people fall in love and stay in love with the game, and moving from somewhere where they discover football, developing football, and then get to some performance and. And so, you know, I, I won't, I won't go through all the, the different bits and pieces of it, but I essentially just went through this. Look, mm. this is my process, and I thought, right, I'll put some pictures to it and some words to it. So, look, the words on the in the in the black boxes there, they came straight from from this much bigger document that I've got, and then I essentially just tried to, yeah. So rather than it being a theoretical thing like you might get on a course or in a book. Look, they, this is what I mean. So, you know, for mm. instance, if that's the picture of the game, let's be able to turn that into something. If, if that's my playing style and, and that's my game model, which mm. are, you know, aligned to the FFA's one, but they're a bit different because it, it's it's me. Yes. And again, people don't have to agree with that. They can disagree all they want, no problem. But maybe it's something that they go, oh, I'll do something similar. Brilliant. Yep. And then yep. coming through, I think, well, I, I talked about, in, you know, that idea of embracing chaos. So, so I've got this this sort of thing that, look, you, you can go from repetition to reality in terms of your session design and you can go from clarity to chaos in terms of your coaching behaviours. And yep. we see a lot of people, particularly when they're starting out, that they're going to go repetition and clarity in order to make the session, the training session look good. My mm. challenge back to anybody is, well, what does the game look like? Because reality for me is there's lots of moments of chaos. You know, we generally don't like transition moments in our trainings. We stop it because whatever was meant to happen didn't happen. But I think both from uh, the way the game is going, but also just when you just think about it, those things need to be there because yeah. the game's yeah. not just the technical and the tactical, but also, well, can you physically deal with the transition moments, whether that's with the ball or without the ball? And also, can you psychologically deal with it? What are you going to do when you lose the ball? Go get the ball yeah. back or stop yeah. and scoring or do whatever. And then How true. kind of just looking at it and going, well, sessions need a football focus. Again, what does it need to look like? If you take the game itself, you can probably drive down into what those look like. So, for example, one-on-one, -on -one, 1v1 practices, we've all seen them, we've all done them, myself included. Yep, we'll get a couple of lines here, run around the goal, come in and face each other. But we're, again, coming back to what we talked about before, you go, and re go do the research, go do the reading. Yeah, 80% or whatever it is of 1v1s don't occur front on. But we probably do 80% of our trainings on one-on-one -on -one where it is front on. Yes. And they're going around a goal and running towards each other from like 20, 30 metres away. Well, how often does that one happen? That never happens. And you can take as long as you want because nobody, no recovery defender is going to come. And it's like, that doesn't, I'm not, that just doesn't, like, that, it's probably not going to maybe, maybe what Maybe what you're saying is maybe there's a better use of your time. 
Correct. And yep. then, so from there, you know, so define it, know what it is. Are you going to work on a core skill or a football theme or a problem, a solution, but actually like try to make it look like the game from there. Then it was, once you've got those things, we can mm. design the practice. And I think a lot okay. of people, this is probably step one. Yes. For me, this is like, this is near the end of it. The rest of it's already been kind of worked out now. Mm. I've just gone for one part of a practice there where I would, you know, have something before and after. But just as an example of how that goes, it's come from the game, we've kind of boxed off. Those will be the people. That's what it'll look like. And then, um, again, look, talking about it, you know, we say that from this for this age, it'll be this kind of structure we're training. This age, it'll be this kind of structure. And it's like, well, yeah, I'm not sure that everybody wants to do the same structure every training from an enjoyment point of view. I'm also not mm. entirely sure that that's how people learn the best. And if you train them multiple times a week. And look, it also depends on the age and stage that you're working yeah. with. So yeah. I've worked with 14-year-olds who are probably of a less high footballing ability than seven-year-olds, but they're 14-year-olds as opposed to seven-year-olds. So you can't, like, so they need to be doing something different to seven-year-olds psychosocially, but from a football point of view, they maybe need to be down there. But if you go to them, all right, you're not real good, so we're just going to stand here and pass, they're going to go play AFL. Yes. Where they get to run around a lot, or they're going to go play PlayStation, or, right? Yeah, so, or, or worse, just give up. Yeah, and that, give up and that completely. So, yeah, so there's up. there's this bit, and then I guess some constants. So, try I believe direction and a way to score. We talked about that earlier, and then, and then my belief is is uh, you know having having sort of a constraints based approach. So, attempting to make yourself less important. The words mm. that are coming that are come out of your mouth by what you've done. So. You know, Ben Ben Bartlett, who I mentioned earlier, like a big proponent of the, of the constraints-based approach. He put some brilliant stuff out into the world on social media and things. And, you know, I sort of look at that and go, yeah, that, that resonates with me, that the less I've actually got to tell them, because, again, my, my education background and when I was a teacher in schools before I went into football, yeah, just because you're telling them something doesn't mean they're learning anything, you know, mm. because I think when we stop it, there's sometimes this thing where they're like, all right, mate, uh, yeah, I'll just smile and nod while the old guy talks. Then I can get back to my game. Yeah. Whereas yeah. if it's if it's more related to what they're actually trying to achieve, and we've got some constraints there, mate. You, if you can, all right, well, Sasha Pete, if you can score with two touches or less, I'll give you that goal will be worth three. Whereas mm. if you take more than two touches, that goal will be worth uh, just the one. one. Well, now they might be actually looking to me for help for how they get their three points mm, mm. rather than me stopping them because they took too many touches in my perceived idea yeah. of what good football is. It, it, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I know um, I, I'm working at getting better at this, but, you know, I, I find uh, asking questions of your players for the, for the answer, especially if their teammate is uh, has got the problem, saying, okay, Johnny... How did that work out for you? No, it didn't work out. Ben, what should have Johnny done in that situation? And often he might be able to help his teammate. And the the teammate now becomes the coach. 100%. And it also, so you're also developing some skills within them. So can they peer-to-peer mm. and teach and learn? So yes. maybe within the game, rather than you having a yell from the sideline, their teammate can help them. And mm. then... The other bit that I'm probably starting to move towards is like, particularly with the younger ones, when there's example like catch them being good. So here's an example of somebody doing something good. Hey, let's show everyone rather than always using the example of somebody not getting it. And how mm. could you have done it better? It's, hey, there you go. You've done it brilliantly. Just quickly show everyone and tell us why you did that. Mm. Uh, and, and, and really then, that's, yeah. So that, 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 that point, that sort of, that nuance of building a team culture, right? You want, them to positively reinforce what they've done well, or if they need to tell each other information on the park, you want, you know, your centre back to tell your full back, okay, this is where I need you, right? Because we've got we've got a line to keep, for example, right? So it's, exa- it's, exactly, and yeah. not rely on not rely me. on me, the the adult on the side who hopefully can help them if they don't have the answer, but if they do have the answer, get there, and then 
that that comes into this idea that the sort of the final bit here, which is, well, let's have the detail, let's help them turn the things into it. But ultimately, I, I put it down there, like further down, because for me in my journey, my football detail might be here, and for for some other people. Um, it's, you know, Ivan Nilla coach mentioned before when you know, his is probably here, but for the mum and dad coach or the starting out in the NPL coach, maybe it's here or here. Yep. I think if we design our sessions well enough, yep. based on the game with some good constraints, it's going to be fun. There's going to be learning take place and we don't need then to have astronomical football knowledge to be able to do anything. Now, mm. the more you've got, the better. But I've yep. also seen plenty of people with lots of football knowledge who kill the practice by just going in there and talking the whole time or talking about mm-hmm. stuff that the players, that they don't need yeah. that. They don't understand yeah. that. They don't want that. So yeah. sometimes that would be it. And then, look, the biggest piece, and it's the piece where I think we're, we're all not good enough at it, hey, actually reflect on what your session design and conduct looks like. So, mm. uh, you know, what's success going to look like in the session? Yeah. And then... What did the session look like and was it successful? How are you going to know and what are you going to do now to make it better? So uh, that's, that, that's an interesting point, I mean, that you, you make there. I mean, like, I personally record all of my games, but I was, I was speaking to, an, to another TD and he said, well, why, why aren't you recording your halftime talk? Okay. And I've never recorded, I've never recorded um, a training session, never not once. And, and should I be recording to reflect? Because you don't really know how you behave until you watch yourself back. Ah, absolutely. And uh, if there's one thing being on some things like this and webinars and things that they do, you suddenly realise some of the things that you you do or don't do. And sometimes people point it out to you. I mean, look, when I went for my job at Football New South Wales, I went through the interview process. And then the final question that got asked to me from Warren, Great. He said, how are you perceived by others? Mm. And it, it, it threw me a little flip because it, it wasn't your normal answer. So mm. I, I had an answer yeah, within the context of it. That's fine. But it's something, it's a great question. And it's a great question, I think, to ask in a broader coaching, how are you perceived by your players? Mm. How are you perceived by your peers? How mm. are you perceived by yourself? And are they aligned? So <clears throat> do you think you're a good coach? Most people would answer somewhere yes, between, of I hope so, and yes. Right? <laughs> yeah. um, so, and there's nothing wrong with yes. No, it's good. Right? It's good. It's a good and, starting point. But can you be better? Yes. Well, how? And what do your players think? What do your players want? What do your players need? What does your club want and need? What's your context that you're in? So what's... And how are you going to manage yourself and others? And, and how do you how do the other coaches think of you? And what are your half times like? And mm. do they change according to things? So we'll say things like, for instance, hey, um, we come in half time and say, all right, everybody settle down. The game's not over, but we're saying it pumped up ourselves, you know, or it's yeah. like coaches screaming from the sideline, like, stay calm. <laughs> and it's like <laughs> You're not calm. Like that's not going to work, or, or you know. So, so getting a, an idea of, of that kind of stuff, and, and having some really good three hundred and sixty reflection, and actually asking players what they think, and actually being open to receiving that, and looking at it all as, well, I just want to do a better job. Mm. Um, what did we enjoy about this session? What didn't we? They say, hey, Drew, the middle part was that was rubbish. That's crap. Yeah. Mm. But I thought that was going to be the best part of the session. Do you mm. know what? I've got to go and actually have a think about it. Now, mm. was it crap or did I aim it at the wrong age group? So is okay. it that it yeah. might not be that that's and it is rubbish. It might yeah. just be, ah, okay. That works when I did it with the 16s. Why don't the 12s like it? Well, maybe it's too hard. Maybe it's mm. conceptually too hard or too easy if you yeah. go the other yeah. way. Or yeah. maybe maybe it's just not a good practice. In which yeah. case, no matter how much time I put into designing it, yeah, it might need to go to the side for a while. So, so powerful that that idea, that growth set mindset, and that self reflection, right? So, how often do we do that? You know, how often are we sitting here to try and improve our own self because we're all on a journey, okay? And the journey of a thousand miles starts with a single footstep. But then, when we take those footsteps along the way, 
How do we self-reflect how we did? So today has been a fascinating conversation. I've been uh, truly blessed to, to um, spend time with you, Drew. Uh, I think it's been great. I hope uh, our viewers have, have enjoyed it just as much as I have. Um, so thank you very much for, for taking the time today to really share all of yourself. And I, I feel really, really happy to have spent the last hour with you. Uh, look, absolute pleasure. And look, thanks for taking interest. And like I say, I'm always happy to share. So anytime and, um, you know, hopefully hopefully it uh, keeps the ball rolling. Because like I say, we, there's a lot of good people doing some good things in this country. Awesome. So um, everybody get on LinkedIn and, and make sure that you follow Drew's uh, LinkedIn page. That's where how I came across his session design. And if you can give a shout out to, to the, the, the boys, uh, you've, you've got a podcast with your mates at, there at Foot. Uh, football New South Wales, please make a shout out to your podcast. Yeah, so in the technical area podcast it is, doing it with Chris Adams, Warren Grieve, and uh, yeah, look, it's on um, Apple and, and Spotify, and again, it's just about having conversations, so um, yeah, it's uh, worth checking out, we just have a bit of a ramble with some really interesting people from around yes, the world and, and a few yes, of Great content on there, so make sure everybody go out there and uh, have a bit of a have a bit of a listen. You might learn something. So um, you have a great rest of your day, and and thanks so much for for connecting. Top class. Thanks so much. Cheers. Bye bye.